Thanks for coming. This is open SSH internals for PowerShell pros. That would be you guys, right? I am going to turn my clicker on and then click. Anthony Nocentino. I'm a consultant and trainer and founder of Centino Systems, where I specialize in system architecture and performance. So I like to make the really bad joke that I like to design systems and make them go fast. Uh, data platform MVP, I do a lot of work in the SQL Server community. I also operate in the Linux world. I'm a Linux Foundation certified engineer and all that fun stuff. There's my contact info. Please feel free to email me. I love interacting with you guys uh, for, it'll be at the end of the deck too, uh, interacting with you guys if there are any questions about you know, PowerShell, SQL Server, Linux, things like that. Uh, follow me on Twitter, it's my main way to get information out to the community if you aren't following me already. So you know, things like speaking engagements and blog posts. Uh, I blog relatively frequently, it's gotten a little sparse uh, in the beginning of this year, but it'll get better, I promise. Or at least that's what we all say, right? I'm also a Pluralsight author. I have some free cards up here for you guys. Uh, a lot of today's material exists in Pluralsight courses that I have at a much deeper level and encompassing more topics. So if you want free access to that content, take a card. Uh, I'll leave them up here, up here for you guys so you can spend some time with that after this because we have only 45 minutes today to talk about what we want to talk about. So let's talk about what we want to talk about with the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about remote access concepts and open SSH's architecture, like why is it secure and like what are the facets of a secure system that we need to be concerned about when we provide remote access to our system. We're going to talk about authenticating users and the various authentication, uh, authentication methods that are available to you in SSH and clear up some confusion with how things work in that world. And then we're going to look at how to configure OpenSSH, so where the configuration files live and things like that. So we're going to look at how to do some fun stuff there. Tomorrow, I'm doing a session with Richard Sidway where we're going to go over the remoting stuff. So today, we're going to be kind of solely focused on OpenSSH, how to configure it, how to auth users, things like that, and how it works under the hood. Uh, but tomorrow, we're going to go into from zero to fully feature from uh, a Windows system all the way up through installing OpenSSH and configuring remoting and things like that and what to do along the way when things go wrong. So that's tomorrow. Today is just OpenSSH. So we're going to start off with remote access concepts and OpenSSH architecture or OpenSSH, how I learned to stop worrying. I love remote access. That's Dr. Strangelove, if you guys get the reference. That is Creative Commons, or not Creative Commons. That is a public domain picture, so I did not steal that. There's a thing. I'll tell you about the thing. Uh, so remote access concepts. Let's talk about why remote access is hard and what are the big buckets of things that we have to worry about, right? Primarily, we have to worry about authentication, right? We need to verify the identity of the people that we're letting into our system. That's kind of important, right? Because they can go and do stuff and take data and execute commands and do various things. Then we want to differentiate that between authorization, right? Not only are we letting people in, but who are we letting in, right? And how do we control that? And so granting access to the system. Out of the box, if you install OpenSSH on, or you don't install OpenSSH, out of the box on a CentOS system, anybody can log in. And anybody can log in remotely with root. That's bad news, right? If you think about putting something like that on the internet. And so controlling that is an important thing. And then another big chunk uh, for remote access that I have to be concerned about is integrity, right? Uh, making sure that the message that I sent to the server is the message that gets received by the server, right? If we're doing something like remote command execution, if someone can change the data midstream, that's bad news, right? Because they could change what I want to have happen or intercept my data or anything like that. And so integrity is a big facet of making sure secure systems uh, for remote access. On the architectural side of the house, let's take a look at this picture. From, this is from an O'Reilly book in 2009, The Definitive Guide to SSH, which is aptly named because it's really that good and it's totally pertinent nowadays. I was going to redraw this picture on my own, but this, I think this is a pretty good graphic of what's going on because one of the things that trips people up a lot when they're working with SSH is keys, right? The term's thrown around a lot, and so we've got this really good picture to show us where all of these different keys live. When you log into a system for the first time, like on the server side of the house, you're presented with what's called a host key, right? And that host key exists on the server side and is generated from a public and private key pair. What's presented to you is that host key when you log into the system for the first time, right? You log in, you see that yes, no prompt, right? What do you do with that? You accept that key and you, and you will download that key and stick it in your known host file. Which is interesting because you need to make sure, it's up, at that point in time, it's up to you to make sure that that system is who it says it is. That host key is coming from a system that you're logging into and all subsequent connections will be compared to that host key. So when you log in, that server will present the host key to you. You'll look in your known host file. It'll say, oh, I recognize you and I'm gonna let you log in. If that key changes for some reason, you have to ask yourself the question, why did that key change before you go and interact with that system again? It could be 
that the system was replatformed, just simply rebuilt, a new host key was generated, things like that. Or uh, it could be that the system was compromised and the key had to be regenerated, or maybe there was a DNS hijack and you're no longer logging into the system that you think you're logging into, right? So that's why having that host key protect it and understanding what it means is super critical to your system. And if you do have to make a change, understand why it changed. On the user side of the house, uh, we're gonna talk about authentication methods in a few minutes, but I do wanna call out user keys right now. We can use those to authenticate to the system. We generate a public and private key pair. We take our public key, we stick it on the target server that we wanna log into, into what's called an authorization file. When we log in, we exchange the key information and I get logged into the server with or without a password. Which brings up uh, an interesting point in key-based authentication, which I'll talk about in a second, actually. Once we get logged in, we transition to a connected state where a session key is generated. A session key is ex uh, gonna be exchanged during the connection setup. We'll use asymmetric encryption to exchange this key to feed a symmetric encryption algorithm, which is then gonna be used for the duration of our connection. So there's lots of keys getting thrown around. I just felt like it was important to sort through that right on the head end before we talk about key open SSH functionality, right? Super bad pun there, come on. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. So the number one thing out of the box that we get with open SSH is secure client to server communication, right? We have symmetric encryption for our connection, which is pretty much as good as it's gonna get when we're exchanging data securely between a client and the server. We also have the ability to do remote command execution. I can blast a command at a target and get the output of that command back over standard out and look at those results on my system. Very valuable piece of information there. You guys are probably used to that with remoting. Secure, uh, secure file copy. So I can exchange data between source and destination systems very easily without having to open up new ports, create shares, do anything like that. I can simply exchange data. I can put it on a server or I can pull it off of a server with zero configuration. I can also tunnel arbitrary TCP services to get around things like firewalls, which is actually quite fun. Uh, or if you have an insecure service, or maybe you can't get your uh, security team to open up a port for a particular service, you can tunnel that over uh, TCP IP, or over SSH, that TCP IP connection over SSH to get around those security rules. That, I'm not actually covering that today, but that does exist in my Pluralsight course if you wanna get into how that works. SSH also provides the ability to ensure the system is who the remote system is who it says it is via host keys, right? And that's so critical when we're exchanging data on the public internet. And then finally, message integrity. It also provides that out of the box. So pretty broad, this is actually not all of the features, but pretty broad scope of things that we can get done with just open SSH. So I'm gonna hit you with a little bit of theory, but it come, it'll become very practical very quickly. So we're gonna talk about the process model that exists inside of open SSH and this concept called privilege separation. If I'm on a client and I make a connection to a server, that port that lives on the internet, or that port that's open on my server, on a Linux system, uh, or by default it's gonna be on OpenSSH will be port 22. On a Linux system, <clears throat> ports below 1024 have to be opened by a privileged user, or AKA root, right? Which means my remote access system will have an exposed port on the internet potentially running as root. That sounds kind of scary, right? If you think about that and the uh, potential implications of if someone's able to breach my system uh, through a security vulnerability or things like that. And so the process model that exists inside of OpenSSH, as soon as you connect, what's gonna happen is it's gonna fork a separate process that's called the privilege monitor process, which is gonna facilitate your connection now, right? So basically it accepts it, forks a new process, and hands you off to that other process ID. You're gonna set up your connection for user authentication, and then you're gonna make another connection or another process uh, that's gonna be used for actual data exchange. And this becomes interesting and very practical to us because how many times have you guys restarted your SSH daemon and have not gotten kicked out of your system, right? Just raise your hand if that's happened to you, right? This is why, because you're literally running in a separate process space. So this can come to our advantage if we have to make configuration changes or things like that. So let's get into a demo. So we're gonna do some basic stuff. We're just getting started with SSH. We're gonna look at some host keys we're gonna examine privilege separation, how it works, basic remote command execution. Uh, quick layout of my lab here, because we're doing like remote access stuff, we're gonna be jumping around between computers. This is what we have going on. I have a domain controller, a Linux management workstation, CentOS W1, a Linux server that we're gonna play with, uh, CentOS S1, and a Windows server in this awesome cross-platform world that we live in nowadays. 
And if you guys have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, so I'm gonna put these demos online so you guys will be able to walk through it uh, on your own, but we're gonna go through some basic plumbing stuff right now. So to log into a system, it's gonna be username at hostname, so CentOS S1, and that's gonna be how I can go and attempt to get from the system that I'm in to the system that I want to be in. I am then presented with my host key, right, or at the host key from CentOS S1. At this point in time, I have to make this decision. Do I actually trust the system that I'm trying to log into? I built it, I don't trust it. So let's go ahead, and, <laughs> I'm kidding. So let's go ahead and accept that key, and it's gonna bring that down, and then it's gonna pass me into, really? What are you doing? Ah, there we go, okay. Don't type in demos. Uh, I pass in my password, I get authenticated to the system, CentOS-S1, you can see the new prompt there. So let's get out of that system and look at what actually just occurred. So what actually just occurred is when I downloaded that host key from the remote system, it created this directory just a second ago with these particular permissions, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later, and inside there, we have this thing, now a known host file. Oh wait, hold on, PowerShell is not, no, that'll be all right, cool. Uh, known host, so inside that file, we had the representation of the host key for the system that we just logged into, the host name, the IP, the key type, and then the actual key, right? And so that exists on our system, so now all subsequent logins between me and that server will exchange that information to validate that remote system. Very important, so let's go ahead and see that in action. If you haven't used the minus V attribute on an SSH client, it's pretty cool because it does things like this. You get to see what actually is occurring in your connection. And so we can see the entire process to understand how it actually works. Do, 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 do. So as we scroll up, we can see that it goes and starts the connection. I'm gonna jump through the, I say the less important stuff, but stuff that isn't exactly poignant right now. It's gonna find our host key identified in our file. So you see known host colon one, it's in position number one. So if you do see an error, you'll see like an error on a host, it's a host key that's changed, that value will be the number of, in the key inside your known host file. We then do a key exchange, and then we transition into authentication, which we'll talk about in the next demo. So with that, let's go ahead and log into the system. Because you know, passwords. Uh oh, permission denied. Ah, okay, good. Let's go ahead and ask. Are we logged into CentOS S1? Sudo netstat minus. This is very easy to remember. Netstat minus plant gives you some really cool output. Watch this. Grep, SSH. We get all the listening ports uh, on the system and active connection. So we see. We're listening on the SSH statement, its process ID is listening on all IPs. We also see the IPv6 version, so SSHD listening, but we also see my connection. So that privilege monitor process, SSHD 1599 is established. That's my connection running independently of the other one. So let's take this command. I'm gonna copy and paste this because it's challenging to type in demos. Uh, what this command will do is gives me the process tree for that particular process. So we can see the command that I'm executing the shell that I'm running in, the pseudo terminal, so PTS is pseudo terminal, which is my environment that I'm running in that's being managed by my privilege monitor process that forked off of the original SSHD process, right? The actual daemon that's listening. So now if I do pseudo systemctl restart SSHD, I didn't get kicked out. That's pretty cool. And then if I go and check that again, we can see that it forked the process off. I get the same process ID 1599 and I just go about my day, right? So understanding that it's a, it's a nice little feature, but also keeps us from having to be so terribly concerned about the surface area that's exposed to the world on our system. Now finally, the super basic demo is we're gonna do this. CentOS, log back out to the workstation, so W1. I'm gonna use SSH, my credentials, and then pass a command, simple command, hostname, the remote system. I have no idea what that's all about. I even reboot it before the demos. It's always DNS, right? 
give it my password, it executes that command. That command's output comes across over standard streams and goes to my, con my console here. This becomes a very valuable in being able to blast commands at lots of systems and also retrieve data concurrently. So, or retrieve data programmatically. All right, so demos, who did that? Let's talk about authentication methods. <laughs> Sorry, all right, so authentication methods. So getting users into your server. So now that we know how to get there, let's talk about how people get authenticated to our systems. So authentication methods. GSS API, Generic Security Services API, Kerberos, not the Kerberos that you're thinking of when it comes to AD authentication. This is the actual daemon itself doing, uh, doing authentication for users and the service, right? So we're gonna skip over that and go to, or not skip over that, we're gonna talk about how we would do AD auth in a little bit. Host-based authentication, where I can say two systems can log into each other without a password. That sounds not good, right? Not commonly used, but legacy systems find that they have that, uh, the need for that sometimes. PowerShell has a similar concept too, doesn't it, in remoting? We're talking about host-based authentication. No one is nodding, so I guess not. <laughs> yeah, basically you configure that in your server side and say this host and this host can talk to each other. Yeah, that's a lot better than that. But we have this public key authentication, which we dabbled with a minute ago when we looked at the graphic at the beginning of the session. Key-based authentication. We generate the user key pair. We can put that on a service, right, and execute jobs like that uh, with passwordless authentication. When you generate a key, which we're gonna do in a little bit, it asks you, do you wanna put a password on there? And most of the time people say no, enter, 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 and the key gets generated. And then you can do what's called passwordless authentication, which is great, right? Uh, but if you're into it, put a password on your key, because then boom, you have two-factor authentication and you didn't have to pay a vendor a million dollars to get that, right? So very valuable, something you have, your key, and something you know, your password. Um, interesting side story, uh, when I was a PhD student, my PhD advisor uh, had come from the University of New Hampshire to the University of Mississippi, and he literally had the same public key, private key pair, for 11 years <laughs> with no password. I'm like, dude, really? And so at the time, I was a systems guy for the computer science department, like, you have to do this. He's like, I'm not doing it. He's like, I like servers all over the planet that I have to work with. We did a whole bunch of like geo cluster stuff. And so that was challenging. So not only that, but people get uh, under the misconception that you have to have one key. No, you can actually specify multiple keys and generate those per systems or groups of systems. So you're not restricted to using just that one key. Challenge response, actual two factor authentication and then passwords. Who loves password authentication? Right. So, actually, password authentication, uh, I think, is a misnomer. I actually don't like the fact that it's called password authentication on SSH, because what it's really doing is handing off your authentication to the underlying operating system, which, yes, is passwords. But this is also how we would configure AD authentication, because what we're asking the system to do is we'll configure Linux to authenticate users against AD, and then we just, we just say that, SSH will use password auth, so we'll hit password auth, we'll hand off the authentication to the underlying operating system. It will make the decision, do I authenticate you against the local user database or Active Directory based on the configuration of the system. So password auth is how you get that done. Another thing that's very interesting is these are processed in this order from top down, right? How many times have you distributed a key to a system and all of a sudden you get challenged with a password, right? Because something went wrong with the key distribution, right? This is why, because they are processed in order by default. If you remove password authentication from that from that, uh, let's say, from the lineage of authentication methods for your system, and you had an issue with your public key, then you won't be able to get in, right? Because you don't have that authentication model enabled. So make good choices when you want to figure out how to do that. So authenticating users. So we talked a little bit about this already. Right? We have the local user databases on our system on both Windows and Linux. On Windows, you have the on a local SAM database, I think that's, or whatever that's called. On Windows or on Linux systems, you have uh, the password file and the shadow password file that authenticates local users. We can configure AD authentication. Uh, out of the box, on the Windows side of the house, pretty straightforward. Now, configure AD authentication, you join a domain. It works, yay. <laughs> so AD authentication can be used on Windows and Linux. So when you install OpenSSH on a, Linux, or on a Windows machine, you do nothing. It just works if the thing is domain joined. Uh, 
we do want to differentiate when we're talking about authentication between user lookup and actual user authentication and host authentication. So when you are doing things like combining AD authentication with passwords or with uh, keys, you'll figure you'll see why there's a difference when we do that demonstration in a few minutes. On a Linux side of the house, uh, the System Security Services Daemon or SSSD is what's basically going to broker the deal for your user lookup and your authentication to AD. So we install this thing, SSSD, on Linux. We run one command to join the Linux machine to the domain and we will get AD integrated authentication out of the box. SSSD will manage that all under the hood for you, configure LDAP, configure Kerberos, and also conf uh, configure your local PAM uh, authentication libraries to differentiate between local and remote uh, user database lookups. I'm gonna demo this tomorrow, that configuration tomorrow in my session with Richard. When we do AD auth, you get this wonderful syntax that's gonna be the username at the domain name at the host name. You can shorten it up if you want to, but I actually don't mind it as much. Uh, in most of the systems that I've done where I've done AD integrated authentication on Linux boxes, I have taken it off, so I would just do AEN at host name. That's a little bit more of an advanced configuration. So like I said, tomorrow we are going to go through this stuff. So key-based auth, let's talk about key-based auth because it's a common thing that trips people up and how it works, so let's get through the concepts and we'll show you guys how to do it and how to troubleshoot it in a few minutes. SSS key gen is the command that we would use to generate a key, a public and private key pair for us, right, as users. We generate a public key. By default, it's gonna be called id underscore rsa.pub or whatever.pub, right? You can name it and then use that for other things. And so, but id underscore rsa.pub is the default and what your configuration files will look for out of the box but you can specify a key. If you guys use AWS, right, you know you use that minus I attribute when you download the key from them, that's the same exact concept. The private key has no file extension by default and it's called ID underscore RSA. That's the thing that you wanna keep very, 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 very secure. Getting keys out to servers can be interesting, to say the least, especially in a cross-platform world. In the Linux world, it's super easy. We have a command called SSH copy ID, which is a bash script that will look at my local keys. It will then SCP that over to the remote server, put it in the right place, set the permissions correctly for you, and that'll get you what you need. And we'll demo that today. That does not exist in the Windows world, being able to do something like SSH copy ID, because SSH copy ID does remote command execution, so it's not cross-platform. So things like MKDIR don't mean a lot on, or Chamad don't mean a lot on Windows systems, right? Uh, I wrote a blog post about how to distribute keys to Windows systems uh, a couple weeks ago, that was pretty cool. You can use DSC to push keys out, so if you're doing any sort of automation, that's actually quite cool. And you can use actual PKI. I used to have a link to a Facebook post about this, like the engineering team Facebook post, but they kind of aren't in a good situation when it comes to information security right now. So let's get into a demo and look at generating and distributing a user key and also using a specific key for authentication. So to generate a key, pretty straightforward, SSH minus key gen. Where do I wanna save it? I'm gonna save it in that .ssh directory, which is where all of my other SSH-y stuff, SSH stuff type stuff lives for my user. I'm gonna call it id underscore rsa for the private key. I'm not gonna give it a password because I'm lazy, even though I told you you should do that. Uh, let's see, now with that, go here, we can see we have ID underscore RSA, ID underscore RSA dot pub, and known hosts, which is the host keys. So let's take those, SSH, and copy them to our system. We're gonna copy them over to this guy. Mostly, yeah, it's part of the open SSH installation. So if you go, uh, which is really kind of funny that it's not supported on Windows, but it's part of the GitHub project that's managed by the PowerShell team because it's a direct fork of the code. So it just literally exists in their build. And so I don't know why this is so slow. So right now it's gonna ask me for my password because it's gonna SCP it over there the first time. And then during that transaction, it's gonna make the directory and stick it in the right spot and set their permissions for me. So let's go ahead and log sent to us into the server, and I should be able to get in, no password. Ah, oh, send off. Excuse me? Yeah, totally. Hold on, we'll get there, hang tight. 
So inside there, on the remote system, we're gonna have that, which is gonna be our public key on the remote system. We're gonna talk about the security implications of this now. On a Windows system, actually we're not gonna do that right yet. We're going to back out and do this one more time. So now I'm back on the workstation. I'm gonna throw minus V on here and then log into the system again because I want you guys to see how this works under the hood. So connection attempt, host key, random delay because of demos, and we get logged in. But I do want you guys to see this. What happens from authentication? They're processed in order, right? So we see GSS API first, Kerberos, that fails. And then it goes into public key, it presents the key, and then we see authentication succeeded and the method, public key, right? So then we're authenticated to the system. And then we get in. And so that's a good command to know. Like if something's going wrong, SSH minus V. Yes. Uh, I'll have to look into exactly why that's defined that way, but yeah, I mean, you would think that it would be pub in there. So we looked at that already. So cat, SSH, authorized keys. So that's my key on the remote system living its life. Now, let's do this one more time. Let's go in SSH, and now we're gonna do SSH keygen minus F windows. So I'm gonna generate another key named windows. No password, and we look in here, we see we have another pair, windows and windows pub. To emphasize the point, we have to do, do this. So on windows and the profile, uh, the authorized keys are gonna live in your Windows profile in the .ssh directory, right? So we see, uh, see users aen.ssh. In that directory, the parent directory by default, since it's in my profile, will inherit the permissions from the parent, right? There's a concept called strict modes on in SSH, in your SSH configuration that requires that the uh, folder containing your public, or your, your public key uh, and the, on the remote side, the authorized keys has, is not world readable, right? So if we look at this, not world readable, we see just read and write. The same concept exists on the Windows side, so we have to do these shenanigans to make this work right. So when I said SSH copy ID to the work for you under the hood to make the permissions correctly, it does that, but we don't have that feature in Windows yet. So I just put these commands together to go ahead and have the ability to put the key on the remote system and show you guys in gory detail how that works. So we're gonna use this command sequence to make the directory. We're gonna copy our Windows key over to S1. We are then going to, I'm gonna copy it over as my authorized keys because if there is a key over there, I don't wanna stop over it. So I just take that and I append it to the bottom of the file. I remove the uh, inheritance attribute. I grant system rights to it. And then I grant rights for me. We add system in there because the SSH process the server needs to be able to read the key to auth the user. You can just stick it in the bottom, it'll search it. We can go try putting a space in the front of it, I've never tried that before. Uh, but it'll search, it'll search the file sequentially. So, um, so we're logging into the Windows system for the first time, we need to accept its host key, because we're sending it over to the Windows box. I think I totally just, oh, I got it right. Uh, so we're making a directory. We're gonna copy the file with SCP over there. Paste. We're gonna then append it to the bottom of the file. Paste that in there. Deal with the permissions inheritance. So we'd have to do this on the Linux side of the house uh, conceptually, but it's all buried inside of SSH copy ID for us. Set the system permissions. Give that our password again. I couldn't find a good way to combine this all in one line, so we had, we're stuck doing it this way. There's another way I would have liked to have handled this, but the uh, OpenSSH on Windows doesn't implement a particular feature that I want or need to have it work that way. So if you notice, the last time I copied it over, it actually didn't ask me for my password when I changed it and added me, because the system was able to read it, and I, gave, I, got, key, I got keyless authentication into the system. 
So now let's do this. Let's do minus VVV, which is really verbose. If we go and we look at, where is it? We see our key based authentication. So this actually might be uh, similar to the question that you were asking. It sends over ID underscore RSA, which isn't on that Windows system, right? We sent over Windows to the other system. That fails. So we see the failure. We then send the next key, which reads the next key that's available in that configuration directory, which happens to be the second key that we generated, that one. We then authenticate to our system. And so we can see that there. If you want to specify the key, this is why I love, uh, what do you call this, uh, VS Code. If you want to specify the key, we can use this command. So we do minus VVV this time because there's a particular piece of output that I want to show you guys, minus I, and then I specify the key. And then we get logged into the system, but this time it used that particular key that we wanted to use. So this is a good way to be very specific with which key that we use. So the first one it's sent over is windows.pub and it doesn't have to search for the next key. All right, so more computer stuff. So OpenSSH configuration. Let's talk about how to do some stuff. We're gonna talk about where the configuration files live on the server and on the client. First up, on the server side of the house in Linux, your server daemon's configuration file lives in etsy, ssh, sshd underscore config. On Windows, it lives in percent program data, sshd underscore config. Conventionally, we install things in program files. That's where all the binaries live. Your configuration files, your logs, and your host keys will live in percent program data percent. Same configuration file, all very similar uh, configuration syntax. The files are nearly identical with the exception of platform specific things like paths. On the client side of the house, we have ssh underscore config, which is gonna configure uh, global client uh, functionality for the entire system that we're on. As people get confused between ssh config and sshd config, sshd daemon ssh client. That also can live in your home directory, so you can make a specific configuration file for you and build up some good shortcuts and aliases and things like that for your connections. That lives in percent user profile percent on Windows systems in .ssh config. So, let's look at that. Totally didn't tell you what the demo was gonna do. That's probably an important thing, right? Uh, we're gonna do serv some server configuration over you wanna look at the configuration file. We're gonna limit access to a particular group because out of the box on CentOS machines and on Windows machines, anybody can get in. And so we're gonna use uh, an AD group to sec not say secure the system, but the scope who can actually log into the system. And then we're gonna look at some configuration overview where we're gonna configure aliases and specifying those keys so we don't have to specify that every time we log into a system. All right, I'm gonna make a really bad judgment call right here and do this. Because sometimes that, that terminal color gets all spoiled and I don't know how to fix that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna log into, from the workstation that we're on, log into at CentOS-S1. We're gonna get logged into our server, and the first thing we're gonna do is configure group filtering. Thank you. I'm gonna use the command id and at lab.centinosystems.com to get the user attributes for this particular user. The CentOS machine is already domain joined, uh, so I have the ability to go and ask Active Directory for the user attributes for this particular user with the command ID. So basically I'm just testing the plumbing, right, to make sure that that, that, that works so my demo doesn't bomb. You can see that uh, I am in a group called SSH users, which is a simple AD group that this user just so happens to be in. I wanna make a config, I wanna go ahead and use sudo to edit SSH SSH D config. So inside of here, I'll grab this and put this in my clipboard. No, no, no.
is where you'll have all of the configuration stuff that you'll need for your SSH daemon. Uh, if you're not familiar with the man pages, the man pages is basically online documentation on Linux systems, man sshd underscore config, and you'll get pretty much everything you need to know that's a configurable attribute inside this system or inside this configuration file. One of the things that is neat, or not neat, but nice to have, is that's commented out, so it's actually not an active configuration, but that's the default value, right? And so that's nice to know when you're going through this. So it's gonna be on port 22 for any address family on all IPs and things like that. Let's see, page down. I have a page down key for the first time in 20 years, which is kind of nice. Permit root login, yes. That's the default value. Obviously, that's a bad thing if this thing's gonna live on the internet. Strict modes, yes, that's that thing that makes sure that the parent directory that our configuration data lives in does not, is not world readable. Public key authentication, yes, that's where that file lives on the system that we're gonna authorize users into. Let's see, host-based authentication and things like that. Password authentication exists there. And so let's go ahead and jump to the bottom and add this line. Allow groups SSH users at lab.centinosystems.com. So basically now I'm gonna scope and no longer allow anyone else except unless you're in that group to get into the system, which is I think a pretty good thing to do out of the box. <laughs> right. So let's go ahead and restart SHD. Didn't get kicked out. That's a nice thing. Let's go ahead and do this. So we made that configuration change on CentOS S1. We're on W1 now, and we're gonna go ahead and log into that system like so. And that machine is so slow. Right, right, the like, the hackers just get impatient and leave. So I'm gonna log into the system and it's gonna take forever and it's gonna tell me pa uh, my password or my permission is denied. Can anyone tell me why I can't log into the system? What? A little louder. Right, that's the local user AEN, not the domain user. So I'll simply just go back See, do you guys are paying attention? Such a warm and fuzzy feeling. Dot com. This is why you don't type in demos. It's the magic of command line logins. Yay, right, so I log in. As, actually I don't want to do that, I want to do that. So AEN at lab.centinosystems.com. So that actually works quite well. Oh, we have to do one more demo. So you said that it, it just couldn't be available to the world. My understanding is that the SS, .ssh folder has to be um, only the user who is going to use it. Yeah, so you want it to look like that, so breaking down the permission set, the owner and the group, right? And so read, write, and execute, that's just for me. All the other ones are dashes, which means the group doesn't have access, and other, or world, doesn't have access to the directory. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I just, the reason I, because I just ran into this, I was trying to copy a file as part of an automated process, mm -hmm. but the account that was logging in to run the script was different than the account that I sent the key up for, but mm -hmm. it didn't work. And so, and I didn't, I never done any of this before, I didn't think I, Right, because if I have, if that, uh, if that's Bob, right, and I try to log in as AEN, Bob doesn't, or, or that's Bob, and I try to log in as AEN, well, I don't have access to that because it's owned by Bob, right? Yeah, and so we want to restrict it to the user that is configured. So let's do one more demo. So we're going to go and look at configuring uh, yeah, okay, so that, that was my point actually. So it's not the, the DRWX, it's the user part, right? It has to be right. And I had to do, do uh, what is it, CH? Chamad, yeah, yeah. For, uh, that would be Chowan or Chagroup to do that, yeah. So, also, also, you know, the, it still has to be 7 or Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, not world readable is what strict modes. All right, so let's do this. So we're, I'm going to show this is going to demo this right now. Uh, oh, SSH copy ID. Yeah, look at the source code of that. Like, go to GitHub, even for the PowerShell project, and just look at the source code, and it'll explain in gory details. You'll see how it how it does its thing. So let's do some aliases real fast. Um, so in our .sh directory, I'm going to create a file called config. And in there, I'm going to drop in this text. And we're going to walk through what this means together. So this is a user-specific configuration because I'm creating this file in my home directory. I could certainly put this in Etsy SSH, uh, SSH underscore config, for reals. Uh, SSH config and have this be system wide, but I'm doing this just for me. And so what I'm doing is I'm declaring a host name Linux with the user. I'm going to use always use those attributes for that connection. And so that particular uh, user, that particular host name, and that particular file. There's several. I want to say several hundred, but there's many, many, many configuration options that you can use. Very advanced stuff that you can set up your tunnels this way, so you don't have to go and memorize that syntax every time to make that to do those more advanced configurations. So in the SSH config file, so. To call it, I just call what I named it, right? So I say SSH Windows. And I get a bad ownership problem because strict modes is enabled. So I have to deal with that on that file. So that file gets created with the fact that it's world readable, which is bad news, right, in this world. So we do Jamad, someone said 600, 700, I do 600. Uh, and we do config. We'll get this permission set where it's just read and write and not, no access to anybody else. And now I can say SSH Windows and I'll connect into that system. I'll specify the right key and all that stuff. So that's a good way to you know, build up a nice short set of aliases for the systems they have to get in and out of very frequently. Yeah, so if you are setting up things, uh, group membership's super easy to do, right? But it also provides a lot of value, right? Being able to scope who the authorized users are to get onto your system. So let's, uh, let's wrap it up. They already clapped. I guess it's my signal to wrap it up. Uh, let's talk about what we talked about. Remote access concepts, right? We learned about like, the important things like authentication, and authorization, and integrity, and how that's implemented in OpenSSH with the features that it has, like host keys, user authentication methods and groups, right? Now we kind of went through those big bucket configuration items on why those things are important to configure out of the box to make your system more secure. Uh, we talked about, we did talk about authentication methods and we also talked about how to configure that stuff in our system and some of the gotchas. Tomorrow, I'm gonna do basically uh, from a zero, no win, uh, on a Windows system, no open SSH installed all the way up to AD integrated authentication, key based, all that stuff. Richard and I will be doing that tomorrow uh, at nine o'clock. Uh, so here's my contact info again, the two Pluralsight courses. If you want more access to this stuff, free cards right here. Uh, and if you guys want to get into that, that much more time and details, I do have things like TCP tunnelings covered, remote command execution, iterating over sets of uh, hosts and things like that is covered in there and how to deal with the command output and things like that. So check that out. And thank you guys for coming. I appreciate all of your time. Have a good rest of the day.